Now Gabon, soldiers in the pre-dawn hours popping up on television there to announce they'd overthrown Ali Bongo just an hour after, just as suddenly, in the dead of night, election results had given him a third term in office. We'll ask about the latest, who's in charge in Libreville, about the fate of the 64-year-old Bongo, who uh, barred election observers this time around and cut the internet for last Saturday's vote. And more broadly, about Gabon, an oil-rich former French colony where power has been a family affair for 56 years. More broadly, what are the consequences of what's now the eighth coup in Africa in just three years? What's uh, the path to uh, better governance that puts citizens first? And what role should the international community be playing in these touch-and-go hours? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the coup in Gabon. With us, Nicolas Normand, France's former ambassador to Mali, Senegal, and Congo, Brazzaville. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks as well to former British ambassador uh, to Ghana, Nicholas Westcott, director of the Royal African Society, professor of diplomacy at SOAS University of London. Thanks for joining us. Thanks as well to uh, Florence Bernot, professor of African history at the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. And France 24 senior producer Henri Pierre Mafoulou has been monitoring events all day. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. The uh, France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation, and you have on the hashtag F24Debate. Uh, Gabon, Gabon, by the way, has seen post electoral violence before. They've seen mutinies, attempted coups, yet its leaders have always weathered the storm. This in a nation that's only known three presidents since 1960 and independence from France. Three until today, it seems. Delana de Souza has the story. Crowds gather on the streets of Gabon's capital in celebration. The scenes of joy breaking out hours after the army announced election results from this past weekend's vote were null and void. The president, who earlier was declared the winner, securing a third term, released a video from house arrest. I want to send a message to all the friends that we have all over the world to tell them to make noise, to make noise. For the people here have arrested me. I'm in the residence and nothing happening. Nothing is happening. Away from the presidential palace, the coup leader was celebrated by fellow soldiers. Wednesday began with an announcement from members of the army who said they had decided to defend peace by putting an end to the Bongo regime. As the day progressed, junta leaders came out with a second statement and named people, including the president's son who had been arrested, and detailed their crimes. High treason against national institutions the mass siphoning of public funds, organized financial wrongdoings on an international scale, forgery and the use of forged documents. During the course of the day, scores of people, including women, continued to take to the streets, expressing gratitude to the army. Yes, I'm happy for change. The army liberated the country. Today we are free. Thank you to the army. Thank you to the army. The Bongo family has been in control of Gabon for over half a century, with Ali Bongo in charge for the past 14 years. Saturday's election lacked international observers and saw internet services suspended, raising concerns over the transparency of the vote. Uh, we were shocked this morning when we uh, heard this news waking up here in France. Nicolas Normand, you say you're weren't that surprised. No, I am not that surprised because it was a dangerous election. Uh, the polls were rigged from the beginning and uh, there is a very strong suspicion of a big fraud. And uh, the, the outcome which was uh, announced is not very plausible, is not very likely. You know, 64% for Ali Bongo uh, the, the current president, before being overthrown. Uh, there was already a rigged election seven years ago, and even 14 years uh, ago also, possibly. Uh, so last, at the last election, seven years ago, uh, the margin of victory was about 5,000 ballots. So a very small margin. Now the margin is much bigger in favor 
of uh, Ali Bongo. So it's not uh, plausible, you know. So uh, I cannot prove that the election was rigged, but it's almost sure that there is a big fraud, it, that the result is a sham. All right. Uh, implausible results. Uh, Zimbabwe's opposition would argue that the elections uh, that they've just had there also have implausible results, but you don't see, of course, the army in the street. Why did the military make its move? Oh, well, because the Bongo family holds power, has been holding power for 50, 56 years. And um, I think they are fed up with that. And the population would like to have a, a transition, a, a normal alternance, alternative, an alternative government. And uh, they are deprived of the election. They are deprived of democracy. I think the victim of this situation is not only Ali Bongo, it's also the main opponent who should have been elected in the, instead in the state of uh, Ali Bongo. Uh, his name is uh, Ondo Osa. He is also the victim because uh, the putschists, the, the, the coup leaders, are not there to restore democracy. They are there for themselves to, to have a, a military authoritative regime. They, do, they have not uh, said that they will uh, uh, recount the ballots papers, for instance. So they are not uh, going to restore democracy. They just want to keep the power for themselves. Uh, Albert Ondoansa, he's an economics professor. He managed to, the opposition managed to coalesce for, mm -hmm. for, for this election. And yet, you, you take the point of the ambassador that those celebrating in the streets may not celebrate long if... if, if uh, it turns out this isn't the beginning necessarily of a democracy. No, I quite agree with the ambassador. It seems that um, for the past uh, 60, almost 60 years or so, that the family, Bongo, the dynasty, seems to have a firm grip on power. And I will call it, um, you know, any coup has his own DNA. And this one seems to be more like a family affair in the sense that the general who seems to be running things right now, we heard about what we see in your report, uh, is related to, uh, family related to, uh, to Ali Bongo. So um, the swift reaction from the army is probably the, the what surprises. But in terms of um, the last election was a sham. It was widely said. The opposition managed to also coalesce around Jean Ping, you know, and some of uh, the, 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 the father, Bongo Sr., Omar Bongo, uh, people also tried to ally around um, Jean Pig, but it didn't seem to work out. So I will say that uh, I didn't expect it to be a third time lucky, because that should have been his third term. So not to be a big surprise to me. All right. Well, let me ask you, Nicholas Westcott, when you uh, woke up in sunny London this, uh, this Wednesday, were you surprised? And how's the news sitting where you are? No, I think it's true to say, as uh, the ambassador has, that this was not a surprise, this coup. Um, the Gabonese political system did not carry much legit legitimacy. As you say, uh, the, part, the family had been in power for more or less since independence. Um, people felt unrepresented. And when you have democratic processes that aren't transparent and don't, uh, are not credible, then the government resulting doesn't really have legitimacy and it's very easy for the military to take over. Why do they take over? Because they can. They have the force and uh, as long as they remain loyal to the leader, he stays in power. Uh, as soon as they decide uh, he's not credible, they are taking power themselves, making themselves as popular as they can by uh, arresting his son, who's uh, very flamboyant in his displays of wealth, um, and underlining to people the fact that it's the family that's been getting rich on uh, Gabon's oil wealth and not the people. Yeah, G Gabon, uh, you, you heard a moment ago Henri-Pierre Mafoulou uh, describe it uh, as a family affair. It's different from a lot of other places in that it's not a very populous country and you get, the, you get more of the sense there than anywhere that uh, the, the, the stakeholders, uh, they're, they're there for all to see. Yes, and two-thirds of the population live in the two main towns. Uh, so uh, the population is very concentrated. 
Um, and that makes it quite easy to mobilize the, the crowd in the street, which is what the military seem to be doing. The question is what happens next? Uh, one prediction is, as you say, once the military get into power, they tend to be very reluctant to leave it. Uh, they find that they have access to the wealth, and that's very nice. Um, so whether there will be any process of return to democracy, uh, I agree, I'm a bit skeptical that we will see that, um, in which case the problems will simply continue and be compounded, and the population will eventually get restive, and then you may see the coup leaders resorting to more violent means to keep themselves in power. So the prognosis is not good. That's a real challenge for the international community. A real challenge for the international community. Um, we saw that it was different cores of the military that were present at the reading uh, of that uh, a statement this morning. So obviously this was something that had been uh, thought out. Uh, Brice Olivier Ngema, in the last hour, he's been named transitional president by the coup leaders. Uh, that's according to uh, newswire agencies, AFP and Reuters. Um, earlier, he spoke to uh, French newspaper uh, Le Monde, Florence Bernot, and said uh, of Ali Bongo, he's been retired. He has all his rights. This is, this is you see him there being hoisted to the chance of Odigui for president. Your reaction to that? Um, I was surprised. Uh, and, uh, you know, different from my, uh, my, my colleagues uh, to today, and perhaps they have uh, better information than I, than I did. But I was surprised because many scenarios uh, were kind of floating around uh, about the elections. Uh, everybody knew that uh, the big risk was uh, another bloodshed uh, with the opposition. Uh, but nobody really, I think, knew uh, what the army would do. And this morning when I heard about the putsch, uh, my first reaction was to uh, wait and see if the Guard Republicaine, uh, the Republican Guard, uh, which is the very close elite uh, corps that uh, is extremely well equipped uh, and uh, supposed to protect the president, uh, was part of the putsch or not. Uh, now we know, uh, and I think uh, to, to me that's a sign that uh, the Bongo regime is in, in big uh, trouble. Uh, I don't know much about uh, Oligi. Uh, it's quite interesting that um, my colleague said that he's related to the Bongo family. I'm not quite sure. Uh, his uh, uh, his uh, family is from two regions in Gabon, uh, the Otogwe. Uh, which is in fact uh, also the region from the uh, where the Bongo family originates, uh, but he's also uh, he has also Fan ascendancy. Uh, the Fan as a majority uh, people speaking uh, Fan speaking people in uh, in Gabon. We know also that uh, Oligi was trained in Morocco uh, as well as uh, Ali Bongo. Uh, Ali Bongo is a, 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 a tra was trained uh, as an army officer uh, in uh, uh, Morocco, and we know also that the two men had uh, some kind of conflict after uh, Ali's election in 2009. So I was surprised, and the the second thing that I would like to do a little bit different from uh, my uh, interlocutors tonight uh, is that. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Uh, of course, the military uh, might keep uh, the, the, the power, but they seem to have insisted uh, that they are a transition government. Uh, Oligi himself this, earlier this morning said that uh, he would wait uh, until uh, a meeting uh, to see if he would head uh, the new transition government. So I think we have to uh, wait and see. And perhaps the last thing that I would like to say uh, is to insist again on uh, what happened before the putsch. Uh, I was um, really surprised uh, uh, by the extent to which the Bongo uh, government uh, uh, went uh, to really cordon off the country. I couldn't believe that they had, uh, you know, closed the internet, they actually closed uh, the phone lines. Uh, a number of us in France tried to call family and colleagues in Gabon, and we could not. Uh, they put a curfew. A number of um, uh, Air France planes were uh, um, cancelled. 
and the, the borders uh, were also closed. So, I mean, th those are extreme uh, uh, decisions by, you know, supposedly a democratic government uh, seeking re-election. Uh, you have also to note that the, the result of the election was uh, uh, announced at uh, 3.30 in the morning. Uh, so, you know, all of that had a mark of, of elections that were a, a kind of complete sham. And I, I think that's why the population is, in a way, uh, you know, so far relieved. Nicholas Westcott, people watching in Zimbabwe, where our focus was all of last week, watching a, fl a flawed electoral process there. What do you think is going through their minds as they watch events unfold in Gabon? I think they feel that uh, the military is already in control in Zimbabwe. Um, the ZANU PF has depended upon the loyalty of the military. It represents the military. The military are doing very well economically out of the current situation in Zimbabwe uh, and had been deployed to ensure that uh, Mangagwa uh, was elected as president. So in some ways, the situation is uh, very different in Zimbabwe because there is an organized opposition. Um, and they have been allowed, although under great constraint, to campaign. There was an opposition in uh, Gabon, but it was rather disorganized. It had united around a single uh, candidate, but very late in the day. Um, and Zimbabwe has been under effective military control for a long time. Mugabe always took great uh, pains to keep the military on board. And when he lost the military, they got rid of him and installed their own man. So. That's, I would say, the main difference, uh, that Zimbabwe is already uh, has a government that is effectively run by the military. All right. Uh, present parties on this set uh, accepted. Uh, there was a lot of surprise in France. But that's because uh, French people who follow African events from afar, they just associated Gabon with the Bongo family. Nearly 56 years in power for father and son, Monty Francis looks back. A true political dynasty. The Bongo family has been in power in Gabon for 55 years. Omar Bongo took office as president in 1967, a post he would hold for more than four decades. The country's second president since independence, as head of a single party system, Omar Bongo consolidated power. He emphasized educating the nation's young, but poverty was widespread, despite Gabon being one of Africa's top producers of oil. While many Gabonese people struggled, Omar Bongo was accused of squandering the nation's wealth for his own benefit and that of his large family, including his 54 children. The Gabonese president was accused of receiving kickbacks worth tens of millions of euros from a French oil company. And under growing public pressure and unrest, he introduced a multi-party system into Gabon's politics in the early 1990s. After Omar Bongo's death, his son Ali Bongo was elected president in 2009, a result that was violently contested in the streets. A year later, French prosecutors would accuse the Bongo family of fraudulently amassing a real estate empire in France and abroad worth at least 85 million euros. The democracy is difficult. Ali Bongo claimed victory in 2016, a disputed result again, with his rival Jean Ping claiming fraud, losing the election by just 6,000 votes. EU observers said there was a clear anomaly in the vote, and again there was violence in the streets. Several people were killed and hundreds were hurt. Two years later, Ali Bongo suffered a stroke while visiting Saudi Arabia. Hospitalized in the kingdom for more than a month, he was later transferred to Morocco to recover, and rumors swirled about his health. He finally reemerged, putting those rumors to rest. Today, as you can see, I am better, and I am planning to see you again, soon. Following his stroke, Ali Bongo's bid for re-election in 2023 marked a return to the spotlight and a now unrealized hope to extend his family's political legacy well into the future. Nicolas Normand, um, at the French Foreign Ministry tomorrow morning, Will it be strange to envisage a Gabon without a bongo in charge? 
Well, you know, I think the French authorities are, are a bit embarrassed by this coup because they were very adamant on the previous coup in Niger. And uh, now this coup uh, has more justifications, is more uh, plausible, is more uh, uh, predictable. Uh, in Niger, you know, uh, there was a good president who, who was improving the situation overall. And uh, this is not at all the same situation in Gabon. Uh, in Gabon, it's very difficult to plead for uh, uh, the overthrow Ali Bongo because uh, uh, he, he rigged the election. Uh, there was a, uh, an obvious fraud. So he played himself with the fire and he, he, he got burned uh, by being overthrown, finally. He ended up because of his own uh, faults, of his own uh, uh, mistakes, you know. So uh, the, the French statement was, uh, we should respect the result of the election. But it was not uh, said whether it was a real result, the hidden results, the official or the official results. You know? So the, the French statement was very ambiguous, you know. And uh, is it ambiguous because they're figuring it out they, as we yes, go along? Yes, because uh, they were embarrassed uh, to say something right. more uh, elaborate. Um, uh, embarrassed to say something more uh, more elaborate. Uh, it, it's uh, it, it's amazing because w w when you look at those images uh, in that report from uh, his rapid ascension under the wing of General de Gaulle's Africa advisor uh, to a four decade reign that include countless trips to Paris, Omar Bongo long symbolized what critics call la France Afrique, that cozy, often nepotistic relationship between former colonizer and colonized, and after. To 2009 and his death, many pledged it would be the end of France Afrique. They still do, to this day, like when France's current president visited Gabon in March. Our common history here with Gabon is also the history of France Africa, and this France Africa era is completely over. Hmm. Uh, your reaction there to, to Emmanuel Macron's words? Well, Emmanuel Macron went to Gabon not to see uh, his counterpart. He, he went there for a UN conference about climate and biodiversity. So it's a, it's a coincidence that it took but place. But every Gabon. French president, but, uh, François you know, Hollande did it. No, uh, no, is, the relationship uh, they all between, say it's the end of France Afrique. No, it is the end because the relationship between France and Gabon are much colder now since uh, 2016. Since the previous election, there is a refreshment in the relations, which are almost cold now, and also the, the affair of uh, uh, those investments in Paris with uh, embezzlement and so on, you know. The ill-gotten gains uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. affair. So uh, the relations were fresh. And this is the reason why Gabon uh, wanted to be a member of Commonwealth, despite the fact that there is no British embassy in Gabon. So they are now a member of Commonwealth just as a reprisal uh, to a retaliation to the French uh, uh, distance uh, position, a more, uh, uh, you know, a less warm uh, relationship with Gabon. Uh, Florence Bernou, uh, you, you expressed surprise at the coup. Were you surprised to hear Ali Bongo from his house arrest speaking in English? <laughs> Yeah, I was. Uh, and, and by the way, I'm not sure whether the, the video has been authenticated. Uh, the first time I saw it, it had not been yet. Uh, so, True. Good point. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, to, to speak about France Africa a little bit, uh, I, I, was, uh, I was in Libreville when uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, visited. Uh, and I must say that it was not uh, seen uh, very well by the Gabonese. Uh, there's quite an anti-French uh, feeling in Gabon. And even though uh, Emmanuel Macron came for the supposedly the forest project, uh, you know, it, he, he, he took pains as saying, no, no, I'm not coming, you know, to, to support Ali Bongo. But if you say that, it means that, you know, it can be taken as a, as a show uh, of support. And I would also say that uh, critique from the Gabonese population uh, were quite clever, uh, and they see very well that uh, this kind of global claims on uh, ecology and biodiversity might be another way of controlling, actually, 
you know, the, the resources uh, and, and economy of Central Africa. Uh, the last thing that I would like to say is I'm, I'm a, I, I would urge uh, ourselves to be a little bit careful when we talk about family uh, kind of politics, uh, to describe Gabon as a kind of family dynasty and politics as family politics, uh, I think is quite paternalistic. And it, it sort of sometimes uh, it might obscures, obscures the fact that uh, uh, Gabon uh, has a history, very complex and rich history of politics, of, of conflicts, of different uh, political forces. And it's not because uh, the government, uh, of course, has been in the Bongo family uh, that I think we can reduce, uh, even in talking, uh, the politics in Gabon uh, to just, you know, a kind of big family having some kind of square missions and, and so on. N N Nicholas Westcott. Uh, if you look at the history of Gabon since 1960, how much or how little is it really, again, down to those two men, Omar Bongo and Ali Bongo? Well, as your uh, colleague has just said, uh, politics is more complicated than that. And the election before this most recent one showed it was very close. Uh, Jean Ping, who was a very considerable figure, he'd be president of the African Union, um, came very close and probably did actually beat Ali Bongo. That might have been a good thing for Gabon if uh, that victory had been acknowledged. Um, so there are, uh, there is quite a complex political system which Bongo was trying, Ali Bongo was trying to manage, but since he suffered the heart attack, he has really not been as effective politically at keeping the various groups uh, on side and ensuring that they too were benefiting. So there is a degree of public support for the coup, um, but the risk is that the coup leaders will not engage with those political forces, but simply try and repress them. That remains to be seen. Hey, and your thoughts, your, your thoughts as well, Nicholas, on the anti-French sentiment that we've been talking about. Uh, is it the same in former British colonies? Yeah. Uh, or is there something different going no. on? There is something different going on, and the strength of anti-French feeling across the whole of West Africa, I think, is coming as uh, quite a shock to the French government, and is being used by coup leaders to consolidate public support for themselves. And also we see, we haven't seen it in Gabon, but elsewhere we've seen Russian flags being waved because coup leaders are posing as the anti-imperialist, anti-French parties. Uh, and this is a, a significant failure. Why is it happening? It's happening because France had never really managed to change its relationship. Uh, Britain, if you like, had stepped back a bit further from uh, its uh, former colonies, and they had a degree of autonomy around themselves, Nigeria, Ghana. There is still quite a degree of sympathy and close link with the UK, partly because the UK is not seen as strong or interfering. Um, France needs to very rapidly recalibrate its whole Africa policy because uh, there are other countries nearby that are quite vulnerable to the same kind of process. We look at Equatorial Guinea, we look at the Republic of Congo, maybe Cameroon. Uh, I, if I was the president of those countries, I'd be feeling nervous. And uh, feeling nervous in those countries, uh, there is a country that's not a former French colony, but where they speak French, which is... Uh, DRC, uh, Congo, Kinshasa, they have an election at the end of the year. Yes, indeed. Again, this relation, troubled relationship between France and the African continent, does it spill over there when the build-up to that race? But first of all, uh, DRC is the biggest French-speaking country in the world right now. So it does have weight. And uh, as someone said, uh, back in the days, um, you know, you see the form of Africa and DRC is the trigger, you know, remember about that one. So uh, as DRC goes, so goes the rest of Central Africa and they share a border. So there could be um, cause for concern, self to speak. But again, going back to what our other guests were saying, the fact of the matter, it's the power has been in the hands of a father and a son. That's undisputable. Um, in DRC, it's a totally different scenario right now. Um, the person uh, in power right now, Felix Chisekedi, uh, was proclaimed the, the winner of uh, the last election in 2018. 
and after 37 years in opposition. So it's a totally different scenario. Uh, the relationship he's trying to build uh, in a way to consolidate his power, not only politically, but also militarily, it's totally different. So it's in no way comparable. But of course, this whole domino effect that we've been talking about all day long uh, in our newsroom and uh, on air about having... Coup contagions. Coup contagions. That's the word, you see? Uh, I mean, that's a fact. I'm sure that people will be uh, scratching their heads right now. They'll be scrambling for plans. But the fact of the matter is... There's an election in December. Uh, so what's the insurance against coup contagion? There are none. I mean, people tend to say that uh, history tends to repeat itself. When one thing you, you can be sure you can compare is that there are always military aid who's been working almost forever, so to speak, if I may, uh, with, uh, with the, 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 the family in power you know, or, or the, the person in power. Uh, in the case of uh, Brice Oligui, he's been, he's ri he raised through the ranks for about 20 years. He, he used to work with Omar Bongo. So that's one thing. So there's nothing can be guaranteed. General Tiani in Niger, who's someone who used to be also the uh, military aide to the former president, Isufu, who actually was about to retire. I think he's he age, reached the age limit. So these coup contagions, I think, can go one way or the other. There is no insurance. I think we should be, all of us, including us in, 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 uh, in our newsroom, be very humble <laughs> on making any predictions at this point. And uh, uh, Nicolas Normand, do you take uh, Nicholas Westcott's point about what differentiates former French from former British colonies when it comes to Yes, uh, I totally agree with what uh, Nicolas uh, Westcott said. Uh, uh, we are too visible. The French are too visible. They are too present. There is still a currency which has... Uh, which has uh, the same name as in the colonial time, you know, the France CFA. We have military bases. Uh, we have a strong interference in uh, French statements saying what they should do. So the British are much more discreet. They have a low profile. And uh, finally, it's much more effective. And there is, there is less uh, anti-British uh, uh, feeling or sentiment in uh, the English-speaking countries. But we must also add something else. Uh, in the Sahel region, which is a French-speaking uh, area, uh, an area of former French colonies, there is a very deep crisis, a security crisis due to the terrorism uh, groups, jihadist groups, and also uh, 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 an economic crisis because it's a region in the world which is the poorest. And there is also a demographic explosion. You know, the population is growing very fast. So the youth has no education and the youth is hopeless. The youth is uh, in, in a very dire situation, in very dire straits. And so the population is going to rebel. The population is going to, to try to challenge the government and or to topple the government, to overthrow the governments, and also the the French are very linked to the government, so the French become the ideal scapegoat, really. Uh, after having overthrown the government, you just have to uh, kick out the French, you know, because they are the scapegoats. They are responsible, they are co-responsible of the very bad situation in which the population is. Uh, is. Yeah. Uh, Florence Pernod, you agree? Yeah, uh, I agree. I think it's a complicated matter, um, but it's, it's um, you know, on an economic level, uh, uh, the French have enormous interest uh, in, in those countries. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm thinking about, again, the visit of uh, Emmanuel Macron in March in, in Gabon. Uh, I was struck because Emmanuel Macron uh, talked about... Uh, uh, changing the, the function of the French military garrison in Gabon and says that, you know, they would have an educative purpose and they would he would reduce uh, the, uh, the number of soldiers, uh, etc. But he, he talked continuously by saying, we do this, we do that. And I, I was thinking, but how would we feel if a, 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 an African president having some military garrison in Paris, you know, would talk like that, as, you know, we decide to do this with our garrison in Paris, and so on and so forth. There's a lack, 
a complete lack of, of consciousness uh, that, uh, you know, those countries are completely independent and they are interlocutors and they are sovereign. Uh, so, you know, it's this kind of awkwardness of, of, of mistakes uh, and are deeply ingrained in, in, in the mind, apparently, of French politicians that uh, I think, uh, you know, makes the Gabonese uh, convinced that, you know, systematically, not perhaps uh, any president in particular, but there's a system in place where France is indeed an ally of those, of those regimes uh, and also controls much of the, the economic uh, resources. And, and it's hard to say that they are wrong, they're, they're right. Um, Nicholas Westcott, uh, France's president, is the first one born after uh, in independence. Is he faring any better or worse than his predecessors when it comes to handling uh, this, this wave of coups we're seeing? No, I agree with your guest. I think uh, while some of his language is different and he recognizes that Franck Afrique can't continue in the way that it was, uh, he's not yet been convincing uh, to the African public that uh, France's behavior will change. Um, and you know, on the question of return of cultural property, some of these kind of things, yes, he has made important gestures. I think he realizes policy has to change, but he's not able to express that in a way that is credible to the African public. And therefore, uh, the problem remains, it's going to need a bigger change of attitudes uh, in France before this uh, anti-French sentiment uh, begins to disappear. Henri Pierre Mafoudou, the anti-French sentiment cuts two ways because there's this um, talk of anti-imperialist rhetoric uh, uh, about the fact that, you know, there, there are these vested interests. And at the same time, there are also those who complain that uh, the French don't give out enough student visas, and, uh, for instance. I mean, uh, they've been trying to, to move on to this talk about France, I think, bring over for, for years. They're trying to move it from it, uh, I, I must say, from maybe from a political standpoint, but economically and culturally, that's what uh, Emmanuel Macron tried to do, um, trying to not breach the gap, but uh, open up on other uh, subject of matters. And um, I think, you know, uh, you don't get rid of... Uh, 100 years also of uh, being probably engulfed in a, a talk about colonization and all this stuff uh, in, in a generation. Generation is what, like 25 years? Um, all those countries have been independent for so called independence. They got the independence like about 60 years ago. It takes time. And the problem is that uh, uh, nobody wants to mention it, but they also uh, have natural resources. And you have many companies. In the, in the, in the example of uh, Gabon, you have over like 80, between 80 and 100 French companies uh, involved in businesses there. It's, this is not going to go away. And uh, when you think about the, 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 uh, not only the, the inflation, but the, 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 I will say the dire economic uh, situation, the changings of the economies, it's not, they're not going to walk away. They, are, they believe that this relationship gives them some kind of position advantage to, to negotiate sort of things. But now, how do you define that? And that's, I believe, that the whole work. I think people have moved on, or they want to move on, but they have to maybe more, or the Anglo-Saxon side, be more pragmatist, in a sense, more offering, let's say, deals or more viable partnership than just saying that we are there, we hear you. And I think that, you know, it brings into the millions and billions of money, and that's the thing sold out. The ambassador was mentioning this youth who's basically, some of them in some part of Africa are highly educated, but they don't get a job. You, you were mentioning his, uh, student visa. So that's the, the whole thing. You have to take the, the full package and rethink the relationship globally. And I think that one of, one of the, the solutions will be the economy. But uh, how you get that without losing? You know, we're still talking about the France CFA, you know. Yeah, the, the, and all those companies and affiliates being there. They're not, Total Energy and others are not going to go away. Tomorrow, they have signed deals for 50 to 100 years. How do you change that? 
So, Ambassador Normand, if you're whispering into Emmanuel Macron's ear, what would you tell him today? Well, Emmanuel Macron did not announce any new initiative, and he still does not adjust our African policy to the needs of the changes in the population in the countries. We still keep the same money, the same currency, France CFA. We still keep the same military basis, and we still keep patronizing and saying to the governments what they should do. So this is no more acceptable for the population. And we lack uh, sensitivity to sovereignty, you know. Uh, when the French troops were operating in Mali or in uh, the other country in the Sahel, they were acting more or less alone uh, in, in, a, in a substitution way uh, to the local armies. And also they stayed a very long time, you know, nine years in Mali, so, and without uh, visible uh, results. You know, uh, there is still much insecurity. There were still much terrorist attacks. So the people does not understand the role of France. Even uh, they think that we play uh, underground. Uh, uh, you know, there are many complotist uh, theories that we are there to recolonize to uh, exploit the wealth of the country, even if there is very little wealth in the Sahel. There is in Gabon, but not in the Sahel. So we were there mainly to help them to combat terrorism, but it was badly understood because it was badly made. We made many mistakes. The communication was bad, and uh, we did not uh, try to listen to the population and to change the way we were acting. All right, a lot of lessons to learn, a lot more to talk about on this topic. Nicolas Normand, I want to thank you. I want to thank Nicholas Westcott for being with us from London. I want to thank uh, as well Florence Bernot, Henri-Pierre Mafoulou. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.